Yeah, I guess I'll have to get back to you on the, you know, that link for the last session. Um, but I guess we could send out a just send out a memo that that has it on there, uh, maybe afterwards. Okay, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Did you want to wait for a few minutes or did you want to get started? Oh, uh, we can wait for a few more minutes and then, uh, and, uh, we'll try to, you know, not go a full hour, maybe finish up a five tail or something like that. Sure. Mm -hmm. We can go ahead and get started, yep. Sounds good. All right. Well, everyone, welcome to this uh, third session. My name is Evgeny Keratson, one of the cardiovascular disease fellows at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute. It's truly a pleasure to work with Dr. O'Keefe. He's shared his time with us today uh, to teach us on how to code ECGs for the upcoming cardiovascular disease board examination. As part of our presentation etiquette, as before, please silence your microphones if you are not actively participating. <clears throat> that end, we would highly encourage active participation. Uh, for those that have a question during any of these ECGs, please uh, try and direct your questions towards the chat box uh, so that we can try and answer them during the index ECG. If not, we'll try and get to it towards the tail end of the presentation. Um, and then, of course, again, presentation uh, adequate would highly encourage, in this case, participation for those interested in coding an ECG, uh, actively participating. 
please feel free to state your interest. Uh, and with that, Dr. O'Keefe, if you can share your screen, we can get started. Okay. Let's see if we can find the share screen here. It's right to the left of the uh, yeah, there it is, huh? sign button. That it? I uh, don't see it just yet. Let's see. There we go. Okay. And let's see if we get that ECG back up. Okay. You see that now? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is, um, I always love uh, teaching ECGs. I think it's a uh, it's, you know, it's 1 of those things we take for granted, but on the on the boards, for instance, and on rounds, it's really important to, to know the precise. Um, the precise uh, definitions for these various 89 diagnoses that are on the, on the boards and. So, we, uh, for the last 3 years, put together this. Um, with some talented programmers and a lot of help from the fellows, uh, put together the study guide for the for the fellows that has. Now over to 140 uh, ECGs, we'll go through several of them today, but um, I think it's important. That you understand, like, there are some board, there are some ECGs that you're likely to see on the boards and not only do you need to recognize them, but you also need to, um. To be able to code them appropriately and so this, uh, this website, uh, has, uh, has specific, um. You know, examples with, uh, with detailed explanations of how, how to code it. And so we'll just start off with, uh, with an, uh, uh some unknowns here. Um. And if anybody wants to chime in and, you know, take this, uh, take any of them, you know, feel free to un unmute your uh, mic and, and, and see what you uh, take a crack at it. So, anyway, this is a uh, first one is a 26 year old uh, asymptomatic female who's got a family history of non ischemic cardiomyopathy and complete heart. She's uh, without symptoms right now. She's a, you know, I've been taking, I've taken care of her. Her uh, grandfather and her father, um, and uh, now uh, she comes in, you know, for a routine screening ECG. She's thinking about getting pregnant. She uh, recently was married. So, anybody want to take a look, take a crack at this one? Below, if you just scroll down on this, you know, there's there's the the score sheet that we'll we'll get to in a moment, but. Uh, but uh, and hopefully uh, you folks have have access to a copy of that uh, of that score sheet because that's something you really if you're if you're going to be taking the boards especially this fall you need to be really com uh, comfortable with that with that score sheet that's kind of the essence of being able to ace the uh, ECG part of the boards is is knowing the different diagnoses on the score sheet so anybody gonna give it a try I'm not I did, I, it's, it's, it's Kyle here. Oh, hi, Kyle. Good. Thanks. Um, you know, looking, uh, right after these P waves, there's early, uh, like an upsloping. Portion of the QRS, uh, I'd be concerned about like an accessory pathway. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, looking at the EKG, there's, I think we've talked about this before, but there's a lot of striking features. Like you would want to call something like LVH or, um. You know, prominent voltages and leads, but with that accessory pathway, I'd probably just just code it as that. Yeah, it's that's uh, perfect, Lyle, uh, Kyle. Um, so yeah, you know, this is there's a striking delta wave over here in one and AVL, um, and uh, you could see it over here in in uh, uh, V1 as well, and in the lateral precordial leads. Um, it looks like there could be right atrial abnormality. Certainly, there's LVH based on, you know, the the big R waves over here in V5, V6. Although in a 25, in a, in a 26 year old, you know, it might not meet it. But, but the point is, as Kyle mentioned, that once you see WPW, uh, because that accessory pathway totally distorts the normal uh, measurements on an ECG. Basically, you just call the rhythm. In this case, a sinus rhythm, right? And then, and then you'd call WPW. So. Um, <clears throat> 
So WPW is down here with the AV nodal conduction abnormalities. Um, and that's pretty much all you need to do for WPW. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a pattern recognition thing. When you, when you recognize it, just code the rhythm and, and, and move on. But uh, and don't get don't, don't get trapped in you know all sorts of other uh, minutia. Any uh, any questions before we move on? All right, so let's do this one. So this is a 50 year old uh, asymptomatic male who had a recent echo showing that uh, he had a 19 millimeter uh, left ventricular uh, wall thickness. Um, out at the apex, um, <clears throat> but not at the base. And uh, so, um, yeah, so here it is asymptomatic year old male with uh, LVH at the uh, apex. Anybody want to take a crack at this one? Yeah, if you want to do it. Yeah, so uh, I would code here. So asymptomatic male LVH at the apex only. So uh, looks like I would code here sinus rhythm uh, axis appears normal uh, based on Cornell criteria. I can't quite call LVH, although some of the R wave voltages in the precordial leads uh, suggested. So certainly. Um, believe meets that criteria for LVH um, in the lateral leads. As far as um, ST, uh, T wave changes, you certainly have prominent uh, T wave inversions, uh, particularly pronounced in the lateral leads, which would um, make me concerned about something like apical uh, <coughs> uh, obstructive or apical cardiomyopathy, um, HCM. <clears throat> Um, it doesn't look like there's any advanced blocks, so there's, I wouldn't code anything there. And as far as other chamber criteria, I don't think there's any other chamber criteria that I would code there. Um, as far as the actual code for HCM, I believe I saw. Yep, you're yeah, you're right. There's a there's a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They don't specify that it's uh, apical, but you know you're right on. That's apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you know we gave you a huge clue there in the um, in the banner. You know the clinical scenario. But but keep in mind this is very very important for you on the boards, not only in the ECG section but in general. They will give you um, you know huge clues about uh, about you know leading you generally in the right direction. And in this case, um, yeah, Yev has it right. This is a sinus rhythm, and it's also um, it's it's also a sinus bradycardia. The it's actually fifty four beats per minute. When you don't have, as you won't in the um, on the boards, you, they're not going to give you like the QT measurements and the sinus rhythm and all these things that you tend to rely on, you know, for for quantitative measurements from the computer. But if you just count across. This is a 10 second strip, keep in mind. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So how many QRS complexes or P waves you have across the tracing and, and multiply by six. And in this case, it's 90, uh, 54. So it's it's not a sinus rhythm, it's a sinus bradycardia. But um, but more importantly, yeah, it's got this apical, um, it's got this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy pattern. And you could call STT changes secondary to hypertrophy. And you could call LVH, it does meet it by you, um, you know, the Sokolov criteria is 10 uh, greater than 35 in V1 or V2 plus V5 or V6. So you need to memorize a, a few of these, the, the Cornell criteria and the Sokolov criteria for um, for board purposes. But, um, but yeah, so you could call LVH, but it's a bit redundant in the setting of, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, but the reason that I showed this tracing in particular is that you will see a tracing like this on the boards, and it will depend. This could be this could be Wellens waves with uh, with a, you know recent non STEMI or or acute ischemia. Uh, that's a common pattern uh, that 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 they'll show. But again, they they wouldn't have an asymptomatic male with LVH. They would say you know this is a a male who's uh, had uh, 
four hours of chest pain, you know, last night now comes to your office today. Um, so, yeah, the, um, the, the other, you know, the other tracing that that would look a lot like this would be, um, would be somebody with a CNS injury and is on the boards. And so you'd, you'd separate these out by based on, on the clinical scenario. Um, so, in, in fact, this is, uh, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, STT changes, secondary hypertrophy, and like I say, the LVH is, is optional to code. So, any, uh, any questions on that one? What was the um, deduction for the, uh, at, the, at the end of that EKG? It said two, two points were answered incorrectly. Were we not given credit for something there? Let's see. Um... LVH. I think we put the STT changes. Secondary hyper. Yeah, I'm not sure what that. Oh, sinus. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I put I, I put sinus rhythm rather than sinus bradycardia. Oh, okay. So I, I meant to put sinus bradycardia, but yeah. Okay, let's go look at another one here. How about? Um, Okay, here's a here's a 55 year old female with non ischemic cardiomyopathy and uh, emphysema COPD. So uh, lots to uh, lots to lots to uh, score or code on this one. This is uh, this is one you definitely could see on the boards, and this is a good example of one where you kind of really need to understand the score sheet to to, to score it right. But uh, I mean, none of these diagnoses by themselves is particularly tricky, but Anybody, anybody want to, you know, and feel free. It's like, you know, when you put it, he's expecting you to, to ace it. And uh, we just kind of want to have some, some inter interchange. So. Hey, Dr. Keith, this is a talk. Um, so um, I can, t hey, I can take this one. And actually, I think um, I saw this EKG last time and you showed us and, um, so this is sinus rhythm, obviously, uh, with probably a lot, right, atrial enlargement. And then you see uh, evidence of RVH in V1. And at the same time, you see evidence of LVH with the uh, R waves greater than 20 millimeter in V3. So mm -hmm. that's probably combined ventricular hypertrophy with sinus rhythm and uh, probably right atrial enlargement as well. Right. Yeah. And, and there's left atrial enlargement. That's more than negative one by one. And this is more than 2.5 millimeters over here in lead two. Um, this is yeah more than 20 millimeters here. But anytime you see right axis deviation with LVH, that uh, almost by definition is uh, is combined ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and uh, you know the this has caused a Cotts Wachtel phenomenon in the uh, in the mid precordial leads V2 V3. If you look up uh, combined ventricular hypertrophy here. There's a link to that on all the diagnosis. This is a classic kind of pattern where you see these overlapping big QRS complexes with big R and big S waves uh, in, in V2, V3. So yeah, this is, uh, this is um, as you say, right atrial and left atrial enlargement with RVH. And you could call uh, LVH and RVH, but uh, you know, it, it's because the boards has a combined ventricular hypertrophy, you would choose that one along with right axis deviation. Uh, um, so. All right. Very good, Atta. So let's do uh, one of the new ones we just put in here. We're putting in new ones all the time. The fellows and my partners are sending me a lot of in interesting ECGs that we could put on that are relevant to the board. So uh, this is a 34-year-old female, young female who's in the emergency department with chest burning and dyspnea. She has a history of a hypercoagulability disorder. I think specifically was elevated factor eight and being homozygous for the MTFHR um, uh, mutation. So um, yeah, who, who, wants to, who wants to do this one? 34 year old female chest burning. So I can take a shot on this one too. Um, if 
nobody else is. Um, so I think uh, they'll sign his tachycardia, first of all. Um, and then uh, obviously there are clear SD changes, uh, which are seen diffusely throughout the leads. The question is, is this a STEMI or this is per acute pericarditis? Uh, um, I would say I would probably also see some PR depressions in inferior leads. Um, so I'm more inclined towards calling in acute pericarditis because of that and also because the patient is 34 years old. Um, so I think I would probably call sinus tachycardia and then probably acute pericarditis, though I won't be surprised if uh, this is really STEMI. Uh, it could go either way, but I'm more inclined yeah. towards calling pericarditis. Yeah, her, her troponin was already like 5, 5.2. 5. Five in the, in the ED. So, in fact, and you know, and and the hypercoagulability uh, clue here. But you're right. I mean, it's so diffuse. You'd think pericarditis, but there's a couple things that um, that lead you to, to to think it might be ischemic. These are con uh, convex upward uh, ST segment elevations in the lateral precordial leads in V3, um, and, and in one in AVL. Now, granted, they're a little concave in v, in one, in two and in, in AVF, but early in the course of an infarct, you can see some concavity. In in uh, in acute uh, infarctions, but yeah, so no, this is a sinus tachycardia, as Ata said, but it's all, but it's but it's acute infarction, and because it's V three V four, so that would be um, that would be uh, compatible with a um, anterior because V one to V three, uh, two of the three that would be anteroseptal, but on the boards they combine anteroseptal and anterior, and so two two contiguous leads or more between V one and V four is anterior anteroseptal. And then V5, V6 has more than one millimeter ST segment elevation. So that's also an anterolateral infarction and more than one millimeter in one in AVL. So that's a high lateral infarction. So in, in leads two, but not three in AVF, there's also more than one millimeter of ST segment elevation. So do you think we should call an inferior infarction too? I think I so. Think, you know, you might think so. Um, and uh, but But actually the formal definition, this is kind of a good example of of this, the formal definition of a, of an infarction is in the uh, in the region. In this case, the inferior region, the significant ST segment elevation, which is what more than one millimeter uh, of ST segment elevation uh, in in all the leads except V2, V3, and then in V2, V3, they need to be more than two millimeters for males and 1.5 for females. So, um, but but it needs to be in two or more contiguous leads. So this is two or more leads, but they're not contiguous. The lead three is not. If you had lead three involved, then you'd call the inferior as well. But so you wouldn't call the inferior, but you'd call the uh, anterior, anterolateral, and high lateral. There's there's low voltage, less than five millimeters total QRS. You know R plus uh, S amplitude in the precordial leads, <clears throat> and um, and there's there's about eleven millimeters uh, of of QRS in V3. So you don't call the the low amplitude there. Um, but in the precordial leads, but you do in, in the limb leads. So this lady went to uh, urgent catheterization, had a thrombotic occlusion with no plaque underneath, just thrombotic occlusion of her uh, of her proximal LED. Was, the thrombus was aspirated and um, she's, uh, sh she did fine, got to it early enough that her LV recovered. But um, so on this, uh, you'd, you'd score the sinus tachycardia but then you'd also score, um, you know, scoring for uh, injury is optional in the setting of an acute infarction, uh, but you'd code the acute anterolateral and anterior and acute um, uh, lateral um, and the low voltage in the limb leads. So let's see if there was anything else there. You'll see several infarcts. Yeah, we got all those right. Well, you'll see several infarcts uh, on the on the boards uh because lots of times you know the the um the computer is not particularly accurate at uh at calling infarcts or but but that that was tricky and that it was you know very um so diffuse um that that it could have been archived too but again pay close attention to the um close attention to the stem to the lead in dr okay yeah uh, in regard to the CCG, um, whether it's uh, for the test or in real life, um, 
what are your thoughts about the sensitivity and specificity of PR depressions or uh, PR <coughs> elevations and AVR when we're you know looking at these um, you know convex ST change or concave ST changes? Yeah, um, PR depression is uh, is definitely something that I can't tell you the the sp the specific you know sensitivity specificity, but I could tell you that that um, it's definitely one of the things that makes you strongly think about pericarditis when you see it. I mean, to my eye, there was maybe just a hint of it in, in lead three there, um, but, uh, but like with a lot of things, you know, it's sort of like the, the constellation of findings when you see, you know, concave upwards pericard, uh, you know, pericarditis, you know, in everything except AVR and uh, somebody with pleuritic, they'll usually say the pleuritic or positional chest pain. If you see that PR depression, it kind of cinches it. Here, here it was a bit of a red herring and that it didn't, but but it's definitely something to pay attention to. You'll usually see it with with florid um, uh, pericarditis. Okay. Um, how about um, Here's a, here's a pretty straightforward one, but there's still a couple of board related points that 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 you'll that you need to uh, keep in mind when you're when you're learning ECGs to ace the boards. There's these kinds of little um, points you need to keep in mind. So anybody want to take a shot at this? Is a 61. This guy I just saw last week. He's a triathlete, you know, a, a physician, very you know, sort of type A, hard charging guy. Comes in with palpitations, uh, had a coronary calcium score of 545, has never had any coronary symptoms or anything. His uh, cholesterol is a little high, but um, <clears throat> he uh, he's noticing some palpitations. So he came in to see me and uh, uh, he's sitting in the, in the exam room, you know, really no complaints presently, wasn't noticing any palpitations, but uh, this is his ECG. So what do we think here? Yeah, cool. This is the issue. I can take this. Hi, Yeshu. Um, yeah, so it will flutter. Yep. And um, we can plug. We can probably say two is to one block as well. Yep. It's it's two to one block. It most of it. Sometimes it gets a little irregular, but for the most part, those flutter waves are two hundred and forty uh, four beats per minute, and the uh, and the the our waves are uh, uh, the ventricular rates about 120, so it's 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 two to one block, you know, uh, throughout. Anything else? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I'll give you a little hint. Um, anytime you see a tachycardia, whether it's si whether it's supraventricular tachycardia or from originating from a, a ventricular origin. Um, Look, f look for um, uh, alteration in the QRS uh, in the uh, size of the QRS electrical alternance because it's commonly seen, and you can see down here, it's yeah. pretty, um, yeah, it's it's pretty noticeable. You know, it comes and goes, and uh, and there is the electrical alternance. You'd uh, you'd call the atrial flutter, and then you'd pretty much call it a day, uh, call it an ECG. So. Um, the other thing you to notice here is that, like a lot, a lot of people might be tempted, well, there's STT changes. Should we call that? Is that ischemic? I mean, the guy's got a, a lot of plaque in his coronary arteries, and there's some ST segment depression, maybe T wave inversion over here, and almost a little ST segment elevation. The the, the computer actually called this um, acute inferior infarction, which of course it's clearly not that. But but for board purposes, you know, um, these this is what we call pseudo. Repolarization abnormalities. It's just this superimposed sawtooth uh, flutter pattern that is distorting the repolarization segments. And so, um, so yeah, this is uh, you wouldn't call the STT changes at all here. You would just call the atrial flutter uh, and the um, <clears throat> and the um, electrical alternance. So, uh, any question? Let's see. It was one. 
atrial flutter. Oh yeah, the two to one block. I'm sorry, we didn't we 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 talked about that, but yeah, that's another important point to keep in mind. Like when you see a flutter at 140, 150 beats a minute, um, double check that because it's often it's usually uh, when it's in that rate, uh, two to one AV block, and there is. Let's uh, let's go back to that. If you look here under AV conduction abnormalities, <clears throat> there is an AV block two to one. So when you see atrial flutter, think of also uh, coding that uh, that um, two to one AV block. So Keith, even though the AV block a two to one AV block is intermittent, you can still code it. That's what you're saying. Yeah, and this is you know this is pretty consistent, but. When it's the majority of the tracing, you know, I think that, yeah, I think you'd, you would code this two to one AV block. All right, here's a, uh, Here's a male, a 72-year, 71-year-old male with some left shoulder aching and some dyspnea for uh, for a couple of days. Um, let's see, is that the other one? No, that's not it. Sorry, <clears throat> that's not. We wanted uh, 92, not 72. Bear with me here. Okay, so this year old guy who's having recurrent spells where he feels lightheaded as if he might pass out. Um, and uh, so, you know, pre syncopal type spells, uh, no prior history. Um, anybody want to try that one? <clears throat> There's another ECG that you very well could see on the boards. It's important to recognize, recognize this pattern. So I can take a shot at this one. Um, so obviously sinus rhythm, um, some beats are conducted. And then uh, you would see uh, some pause, but I'm not sure if you can uh, quantify that sinus pause because it seems to be less than two seconds. But it could be a sinoatrial exit block here um, because I don't see any P waves um, and I don't see an QRS either. Right. So I think I, I would quote for sinus rhythm and probably quote for sinoatrial exit block. And yeah. uh... so, if so look, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, right one branch block. Sorry. Sorry, somebody mm -hmm. was calling me in the middle of my. Okay. Um, so that's about uh, 1500 milliseconds. And this, and uh, if you look at the, at the pause, it's also around. 1500 milliseconds, you know, so in other words, it's a, it's a P it's a, um, a dropped beat with, um, <clears throat> with, uh, with no P wave in between there. I mean, the, the P just gone best seen down here on the, on the rhythm strip and, uh, and this, this recurring pause is sort of a pattern beating, but this is not Mobitz one or Mobitz two, because there's no P wave there. This is SA, SA uh, exit block type two, and you don't need to know type one or type two uh, for the board, it's just an SA exit block. Um, and, uh, and, and also, as Ata mentioned, there, you know, there's a right bundle branch block here. There's also left axis deviation, um, and there's Q. Your infarction uh, <clears throat> with left axis deviation and right bundle branch block and the SA exit block. These are all um, this SA exit block and the um, the right bundle branch block complete. But the, the 120 milliseconds is the cutoff from, from complete to incomplete and uh, needs to be at least 90 milliseconds long to be called incomplete left bundle or right bundle. Uh, and then you have the left axis deviation here. Um, and uh, we got pretty much all of it, didn't we? The, um, yeah, should it be it? SA exit block is something you commonly see in elderly people as, as a component of the, uh, 
of the six sinus syndrome. I say exit block left. Hand. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is one that that I just edited uh, today. The the answer uh, the answer is need a little tweaking there on that one. But yeah, we we pretty much covered all the all the correct uh, correct answers for that. The inferior infarct. So let's see. How about um, another rhythm issue here? So here's a seven. Here's a 73 year old male with recent stenting a couple of days ago of his left circumflex coronary artery, and uh, he's uh, he's asymptomatic presently. This is just a routine follow up uh, post uh, post stenting ECG. Hi, Doctor O'Keefe. You can uh, take this one. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so it looks like there are a few P waves, like in lead one, the first beat has a P wave. So I think right. the underlying rhythm would be sinus, but then, uh, the next several, uh, beats after that, they kind of change axis, especially in lead two, three. Um, and I don't see P waves as easily. And so this could be like, um, a ventricular escape rhythm. I mean, it's definitely a ventricular rhythm. You could tell yeah, by. I don't know if it's. I guess. I don't know if it's quite fast enough to call it VT. Right. It's 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 at like uh, it's like eighty five ninety beats a minute. So. So it's not VT, but it does have that you know R wave and AVR, and you know mm -hmm. it's it's it's, uh, it's wider than one hundred and twenty milliseconds, and um, so um, yeah, it is ventricular origin. What's this beat? The first beat after it for this rhythm breaks. Same morphology as the sinus over here. But... Yeah, I don't see a a clear P wave there. If it's a fusion beat, yeah. Maybe that it's. Um... I think it's, no, it looks it's, like. A... It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so that's a that's a, a junctional escape beat, <clears throat> and uh, and it's uh, you know there is uh, this would be accelerated idioventricular rhythm. You know right. anything anything like fifty five to one hundred and ten beats per minute. Um, they consider uh, you know and one hundred to one hundred and ten is sort of a gray zone. But but this is this is typical in that it's you know it's not premature. It's not late either. I mean, this is just um, <clears throat> some irri leftover irritability from his recent uh, sort of non um So you'd call the sinus rhythm, you'd call the AIVR, you call this junctional escape beat, and these are these non-specific STT changes. It's not not enough to call ischemic, but this flattening is typical of the non-specific STT changes. And if you measure this out, it's hard without the. It's 110 milliseconds, so it just barely meets a non-specific IVCD criteria. Anything over 110 milliseconds is a is a non-specific IVCD when it's a it's not a right bundle or a or or a left bundle pattern. So yeah, so you'd call the sinus rhythm. You have you know under the ventricular rhythms, you know you have an AIVR accelerated idioventricular rhythm, and the um, and then the non-specific IVCD. And over here, you also have to code the the junctional escape complex. Um, and um, what else do we have? Like, oh yeah, the non non specific STT changes. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that you know it's uh, you, you could see something like this on the boards, and you just kind of need to know these specific uh, these specific criteria to uh, to know when to call it AIVR versus the idioventricular rhythm versus VT. That's yeah, I think for that ECG, there was a question about uh, retrograde P waves after the ventricular beat. Yeah, I think that's true. If you could see that, that's a good point. There's a retrograde P wave there in AV, AVF, and you can even see it down here in the rhythm strip, that little, that little uh, sort of notch, upward notch in the T wave is a, uh, is a, uh, is a P wave that's uh, retrograde. Good pickup. 
Prokeev, is there a way to differentiate between accelerated junctional rhythm and accelerated idioventricular rhythm? Um, yeah, so the difference between an accelerated junctional rhythm and accelerated idioventricular rhythm is generally <clears throat> the QRS duration. You know, the QRS duration is above with uh, above 120 milliseconds uh, with a right bundle pattern and more like above 130 with a left bundle pattern. You know, it makes you think of a ventricular escape or accelerated idioventricular or accelerated junctional. Um, sometimes you'll see um, um, other things. I mean, the, the, the junctional beats can sometimes be a little bit sort of aberrantly conducted compared to uh, compared to a sinus beat, but but mostly it's just the um, the the width of it, and, and also the company it keeps. You know, like if you're seeing, you know, a high grade AV block, and the rates uh, and the rate is, uh, I mean, it's a complete hard block, and the rate is 35, and QRS is only 130 milliseconds. You'd still think it's probably more like a like a, a junctional, I mean, a, a, a idioventricular rhythm because junctional rhythms are usually um, escape junctional rhythms are usually 40 to 60 and accelerated junctional rhythm above 60. Um, and, and escape ventricular rhythms are more like anywhere from 20 to 50, but typically 30 or 40. Okay. Here's a 21 year old male um, whose uh, father died at sudden cardiac arrest at age 39. Um, he's yeah, only 21, no symptoms, just comes in for a screening physical uh, for, can't remember what the screening physical was for, but he didn't have any symptoms. I can take this one, Dr. O'Keefe. Okay. Um, so, Is Krishna? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. So it's, uh, Seems to be sinus rhythm. I don't think the PR interval is is that short. It's more than three. So normal sinus rhythm. The yep. the thing that's striking is uh, you know like V one, V one, V two uh, has. I mean I think it's probably like an epsilon wave. I uh, versus a Brugada, or I mean we can call it like incomplete right bundle. But I mean I think this would be ARVC or something along those lines. Uh, yeah, because of, I, I think that's some... an epsilon wave. Yeah. Um, well, it is. It does look a bit like an epsilon wave. Um, yeah. But um, <clears throat> but a... this this is. I mean, it's tricky, and they probably wouldn't show you on this subtle with um, uh, on the boards. But this is a brigada. Brigada. Uh, yeah, it's it's a type three brigada. So it's got the saddle back findings and the incomplete right bundle branch block, which you don't see everywhere else, by the way. So that's a kind of a clue that it's that's a Brigada thing, this incomplete right bundle branch pattern in V1, V2, but not elsewhere. Um, and then and then the saddleback sagging ST segment depression, which is typical of Brigada type two. Um, and you don't need to know the different types of Brigada for the uh, for the boards, but um, <clears throat> but if the ST segment elevation in either V in in either type one or type two is less than two millimeters, then it's um, <clears throat> this it's um, it's not type one brigada. Here, let me just show you some examples here on the on the link. Um, so this would be type this would be a type one brigada, and this is a type two, and this is the saddleback. But see, it's more than two millimeters of ST segment elevation there in leads V two V three, whereas the current uh, tracing is. Um, is you know has less than two millimeters, so it could look like this or like this, but have less than two millimeters ST semi elevation and leads V1 to V3 in two or more leads, and then you'd call it you know type three. But for the for the board purposes, you just need to look at these two and recognize these two patterns. And to call the you know the Brunerato syndrome, besides the pattern, you need to have um, <clears throat> also you know like a, a family history of sudden cardiac death at a younger age or a history of syncope in the patient, um, then you can, you know, think about um, a, think about a, um, an ICD. So this would just be a sinus rhythm brigada. The incomplete right bundle branch uh, block that Krishna called is definitely there. It's, it's somewhat optional because it's, it kind of goes with the, um, it goes with the brigada syndrome. So, um, so yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> That's that. There's the saddleback stuff there. 
Any other questions before we move on to the next one? That's, you'll probably, I would not be surprised, often on the cardiology boards, there's a Brigada pattern that shows up in the, in the ECG, uh, in the ECG section. All right, let's try this one. Here's a 54-year-old smoker who's got uh, chest discomfort for three hours. Pretty straightforward. Anybody want to take a shot at that? I can go, Ben. Um, okay. If yeah. someone mm -hmm. wants to so this is normal sinus rhythm, uh, inferior MI and posterior MI. Probably right. lat, uh, no, that, that's pretty much it. Um, thinking lateral, V5, V6 also probably has, yeah. I I remember, it just needs it, one, one millimeter in V5, V4, V6. Yeah. Two, so it would one, be one, it, yeah, go ahead. Inferior, posterior, and lateral. Very good, yeah, acute infarctions with a sinus rhythm. And uh, yeah, so that's that's about it. The um, <clears throat> so like you could say, like there might be an anterior infarct too, but it's in V four, but it's not in V three. V four is sort of a you know it, it it can go either way. It can it can be counted as an anterior or anterolateral, but you just need two of the three, V four to V six to call an anterolateral for the boards and and uh, two uh, contiguous uh, inlets V one to V four to call anterior or anteroseptal. So yeah, so we would call a sinus rhythm with an acute uh, uh, anterolateral and uh, posterior and inferior. The ST teaching just suggesting myocardial injury, as we've talked about before, is is optional. Um, you won't get docked off for it um, in this setting, but you probably won't get credit for it either. So yeah. So I Doctor O'Keefe, would we code anterolateral because the V one V one to V four, there's not really it doesn't meet criteria. Oh yeah, yeah. So I oh no, no, but yeah. So so it's anterolateral because it's you know it's two out of the three for V four to V six, but for anterior or anteroseptal, you need two or more from V one to V four. So you only have one in V four. But this is not, this is not, uh, remember for, for V3, you need, that might be one millimeter, but you need like, you need two for a male. You need two mm -hmm. millimeters, ST segment elevation in V3, V2, V3 to be calling uh, an acute infarction anteriorly. So I can't call this only lateral MI because of only V5, really, V5 and V6. Yeah, you'd call it, you know, you just call it anter acute anterolateral. Anterolateral and not only lateral, okay. Yeah, yeah, not lateral. Lateral, for board purposes, is 1 in AVL. Anterolateral okay. is V4 to V6. Inferior, of course, is 2, 3 AVF. Posterior is when you have a, when you have a, a prominent R wave greater than S wave in V1 or V2, particularly in the setting of uh, inferior infarction, whether, the, whether it's old or new, when you see Q waves here or SD segment elevation here and these these prominent R waves in V1, V2, then you call the, the posterior infarction. Dr. Key for the posterior wall infarct, it doesn't have to be in two or more contiguous leads. Um, yes, it does. Uh, the, the, um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, it does. I guess what I was trying to remember is the, you know, like a, a Q wave we consider um, significant if it's uh, greater than 30 milliseconds everywhere except v2 v3 then it only has to be 20 minutes but there's not a specific you know criteria about the width of the um of the uh prominent r wave and and it can be either v1 or v2 as long as you also have the supporting evidence uh of the inferior infarction This is another one that you know is a little tricky, um, but um, but it's a board diagnosis that you need to recognize. So this is a 47 year old woman post thyroidectomy in the hospital um, with muscle cramps. Uh, you're doing a consult on her, and this is what the ECG looks like. So uh, so. 
so I can take a shot at this one. Um, okay. So um, there's sinus rhythm, and uh, and I think uh, QT interval is prolonged and. Yep. It's like five, yeah, the, and 10, half five, mm -hmm. 20 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that a stem gives me a clue. The patient had thyroidectomy, so probably also had her parathyroid glands removed. So she's probably having hypocalcemia causing uh, prolonged QT interval or QT segment, whatever you want to call it. So I would quote for a sinus rhythm, uh, prolonged QTC, and then probably for a hypocalcemia. Mm -hmm. Right. Really, very, very good. And again, Ta, you know, really works that uh, that stem. You know, something like this. This is a very subtle, non-specific. I mean, it's clearly QT prolongation, but but to pick up that this would be consistent with hypercal uh, uh, hypocalcemia is um, you know is a uh, is tricky, and um, and so uh, in fact, this is um, a sinus rhythm with aren't QT over here. Um, and also keep okay, and so then it's um, hypo uh, hypocalcemia. I think there's also um, a left anterior fascicular block. So not quite. Sure, and this is where it's tricky when you, you don't have the measurements. The left axis, it's not even quite left axis. It's minus uh, twenty eight degrees. You know, so it, it's it's definitely a leftward axis, and I mean point, but it does out of the point. Um, but there's an STT changes on the board score sheet. So it says STT changes suggesting electrolyte disturbance. So when you see a pattern that's either hypokalemia or hypercalcemia or hyperkalemia or hypocalcemia, those are the four electrolyte disturbances, low or high potassium, low or high calcium. Lo, you know, uh, don't forget to, to code for that STT changes of the um, uh, of electrolyte disturbance. So. Uh, so there you have it. Yeah, we got that one right. Um, all right, maybe we'll just do. Um, we'll do one more. Call it a day. Appreciate you guys spending some time with us. Uh, your valuable weekend time with us on these ECGs, and uh, I know it'll pay off for you because. Uh, the, the boards have traditionally been overrepresented. Uh, the ECGs have been overrepresented in the boards, and this is the kind of thing you just uh, um, you can really you know predictably. We've been doing this for decades of coaching fellows on how to do this predictably ace the 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 ECG part of the boards by understanding how to score these things. And like I say, if you use this O'KeefeECG.com, you can have access to all these different you know. As we've been kind of demonstrating these, the, the criteria, you just click that that link, uh, and it'll show you examples of Brigade or anything else and, and a specific criteria. So this is a 49 year old female who's on uh, flecainide uh, for suppressing uh, VPCs who presents with complaints of dizziness and, and lightheadedness. I can take this. This is Yeshu. Okay, go ahead, Yeshu. I think the uh, stem helps here. So, um, um, so let's say, um, the, um, so the curious is prolonged. So that's the main thing here. Um, really prolonged, uh, right? Like 200 yeah, milliseconds. Really prolonged. Yeah. yeah. And that's, uh, I couldn't find a code for the, you know, toxicity. Um, Used to be. That's that's very very uh, astute uh, issue. There there used to be a, you know, uh, suggesting uh, antiarrhythmic uh, toxicity, but um, they they took it off in in recent uh, a couple of years ago, off the board score sheet. Just like the other change that they made in the couple the last couple of years is for acute infarction. You don't have to have Q waves like they used to say Q wave infarction. You know these days we don't wait for Q waves to develop to call it an infarction clinically, and you don't on the boards either. But but yeah, you know, you're right. This is antiarrhythmic drug toxicity, uh, but um, but we're just coding the stations of it, not the you know clinical disorder. Yeah, um, it's really I hard to see, see the P waves, P but if you look at yeah, yeah, this lead three and lead V, I think I think we may be able to see it. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 so anything else prolonged here besides the QRS? 
Um, I think the QT is pretty long as well. Yeah, QT is, is, is big and long as well. You know, when you don't have the QT measurements, like you won't for the boards, if the QT, so there's the Q to the T, end of the T is there. If it's, if you can eyeball it and say it's more than half the distance from the RR interval, if it's more than half, it's, it's a quick and dirty way to call prolonged QT. Um, as long as it's not tachycardic, if it's above 100, you can't use that, that, that rule of thumb, but, but this is clearly prolonged QT and, um, and a prolonged PR, you know, the, and flattened uh, P wave and a prolonged PR. So, you know, it's first gravy block, prolonged QT, prolonged QRS. Um, but is there any specific pattern in that prolongation of the QRS that you would call any conduction defects? Kind of looks like you know, right bundles. Yeah. So and, I, mean, I, I don't know if you want to call also right axis, but uh, it is right axis. And you know, in the setting when everything is prolonged, and eventually, you know, if the if Fleck and I got much higher, we'd probably have cardiac arrest. You know, like to do with antiarrhythmic drug toxicity or digoxin toxicity. Um, so, so in fact, this is uh, it's right bundle branch block. It's left posterior fascicular block because of that right axis deviation without another cause for it. Now, granted, this is like a, a really bizarre sort of looking um, tracing just because everything is so drawn out. Sometimes you see something like this with hyperkalemia as well. But again, the stem tells you here, this is flecainide toxicity. So, um, so yeah, you'd, you'd call the, um, you'd call the sinus rhythm, you'd call the, um, these the first gravy block, and you call the left posterior fascicular block, which is you, you call when you see a right axis deviation more than 100 degree, plus 100, with no other like you know big R waves in in V1 V2 to suggest RVH or uh, or other causes uh, like right right bundle branch block, other things that that make you know extracardia or or uh, limb lead switch, other things that can cause right axis deviation. If you don't see that, it's kind of a diagnosis of exclusion left posterior fascicular block. And it's also the least common of the three major fascicular blocks between left bundle, right bundle. Right bundle's most common than left bundle, then left post, then left, no, sorry, right bundle, then left anterior fascicular block, then, then left bundle branch block, and left posterior fascicular block is usually due to coronary disease, but in this case, it's due to drug toxicity. So, um, these would be, um, yeah, I don't know what you'd call those STT changes. I mean, but you definitely call a prolonged QT interval. And uh, I guess that's about it, right? So, um, yeah, this lady did, in fact, had a, you know, like a very toxic flecainide level that that normalized, uh, have we, you know, got her in it with, uh, um, and, and her ECG completely normalized all these all these conduction defects uh, went away. So, um, yeah. So I think uh, so the, yeah. Go ahead. So for the prolonged uh, QRS, you know, that's only represented by the right bundle. Um. Say so again. The, uh, the so, so it's the, basically uh, prolonged QRS is the hallmark of uh, you know flecainite toxicity, and then here it's so for coding purpose. That's only represented by the right bundle, that right? No, I mean the the left posterior fascicular block would also be just due to general poisoning of the myocardium and the conduction system. So, you know, um, those are you know secondary to that. And like I say, all that stuff went away when uh, uh, when the flecainide level you know drifted back down towards normal. So, um, yeah, it's. Um, you, you may see a left posterior fascicular block on the boards. It's uh, like I say, it's it, it's not an easy diagnosis to make just because it's an axis shift without another cause, and so it it sometimes is is hard to hard to uh, sort of remember. So I don't know. You have if you have any closing comments? I would just say thank thanks for joining us this Saturday. I hope you learned something. Appreciate you uh, you investing us some time with us, and uh, I know you'll you'll do well on the. ECG, a part of the boards, and like I say, keep in mind if you want to use this study guide, we're adding more stuff to it all the time. I mean, I think I'm very confident it it definitely is the is the um, a, a good way to to ace the boards. It's okay for teach calm. Thanks, uh, Doctor Oki. Doesn't uh, left posterior fascicular block has to be less than 120 millisecond for diagnosis? Is that right? Oh, okay. Wow. 
Yeah. Okay. I guess is that that's the formal definition. I I didn't appreciate that, but I know with left anterior fascicular block, it has to be less than 110 milliseconds. Um, and you know, otherwise you'd call it a non-specific IVCD. And you know, in this case, yeah, I think I guess you're right. Got there. Good point. Well, thanks everybody for participating um, and uh, joining us again today. This uh, lecture will be uh, posted to uh, the YouTube uh, channel that we've created, um, and uh, that should be easy to find. If for any reason it's not, then uh, let us know. But uh, both last uh, session and this session will definitely be available uh, for review. As far as upcoming sessions, we certainly will have additional sessions coming up, and uh, we'll be sending out that information through the program coordinators, as well as through the WhatsApp forum so that um, all can anticipate and uh, and uh, join us as well. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe and uh, thanks for joining. Thanks, everybody.